Good morning, everyone. It is uh, uh, a real pleasure to, to be here today in this context, which is somewhat unusual for me. But I think it's, uh, uh, it's so important, actually, that we try to, to connect the broad picture and EU debates with what happens uh, at local level. So I'm really grateful for, for the invitation. Before I start, let me say a couple of things about what I usually do. So I'm director of research at CEPS, Center for European Policy Studies in, uh, in Brussels. CEPS is one of the largest and older, older think tanks in, uh, in Europe. Uh, we are more than 50 researchers. And basically what we do is we conduct evidence-based analysis and we are a forum for policy debate. And our main um, topic is EU policies. But we are completely independent from EU institutions and we have a vast, um, uh, large variety of, of stakeholders. These are national governments, um, EU institutions, of course, but also companies and uh, social partners. So in this sense, we have quite a broad view. And I would like to share with you some of the thinking, some of the reasoning, and some of the challenges that we are investigating at, at the moment. And uh, uh, actually, I realized that uh, uh, in the quite long presentation that, that I have, there is uh, a substantial overlap with some of the points which have been highlighted by the, the previous speakers. So with this, um, I would like to, uh, to start my presentation. My purpose is really to give you the, the big picture. And I want to uh, focus on three main points. The first one, I would like to take a look at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the economy and on the labor market. I want to focus on, on the pandemic not only because the pandemic, unfortunately, is not uh, over yet, but because I believe that the pandemic has been amplifying and forcing some of the previous trends uh, which are going to be with us for quite a long period. So if we want to have a long-term horizon and look into the future, we need to be fully aware of what this means. In my second part, I would like to highlight what are the policy challenges, focusing essentially on the economy, but also on society and social uh, labor market challenges. And as a third point, I would like to highlight what are the EU levers, what are the EU tools available uh, also to um, national, local authorities in order to address those challenges. So let me first start with a bit of macroeconomic perspective. There is a lot of talk about uh, how the economy is doing, growth, inflation. So I would like to give a bit of, of, of a perspective. And then I would like to go more in detail on the labor market, because I think it's, it's more relevant for uh, what we are discussing today. So um, COVID can be defined as a symmetric shock. So everyone has been hit by, by COVID. But in fact, the impact has been extremely heterogeneous. And this is one of the specific features of, of this crisis, very different from, from the past. So if you look basically at the contraction in economic activity, this has been very different across sectors. And this also explains why some countries and some regions have been hit more than, uh, than others. And in particular, all so-called contact intensive services have been affected the most. In, in some um, sectors, the fall was uh, about a quarter compared to, to, the, to, to the previous year. This, this is just huge. And everything happened basically in a very limited amount of time. And by contrast, some other sectors, so like industry and, and construction, which tend to be more pro-cyclical, have actually faced the, the crisis in a somewhat uh, a better way. And lastly, services basically um, uh, concentrating or being the, the place where more high skilled workers are concentrated and where the scope for remote work, for teleworking was, was larger, have been less affected. Now, where do we stand now? Um, this is uh, uh, maybe a difficult picture, but I think the message is, is quite clear 
The blue line represents the EU economy, so GDP in, in the EU. And what you can see is just a V-shape. So basically, we had a very substantial uh, contraction in, in the economy, but now we are basically back to pre-COVID as an aggregate. And this is interesting actually to confront with the United States where the, the impact of COVID was somewhat smaller. So the, the V is less deep, is, is the red line. But now the recovery is somewhat being faster in Europe than the United States. They have, of course, their, their own problems, but there was a lot of skepticism about the capability of Europe to, to face the, the crisis. But what we are seeing now is actually more encouraging than what we expected in mid-2020. I mean, of course, there are still a lot of places in, policies in, in, in places which are supporting the economy. Uh, but basically, compared to the global financial crisis, uh, again, quite a lot of, of charts, but uh, what you see in the top is, is really the, the global financial crisis, you can see that uh, uh, the depth of the crisis was, was much less, but this was protective over a very long period. Uh, I'm not telling you something new when I, I say that basically it took about an entire decade to recover to, to previous levels. So this is completely different from what uh, we are seeing today. And what I'm um, uh, explaining uh, about uh, GDPs so or the overall performance of the economy, actually also, also for the labor market. The performance on, on the labor market for the moment is much less worse than one could have imagined at the beginning of, of the crisis. In practice, the impact on, on employment has been very limited. If you look at, at the, the chart at the bottom on the left-hand side, the blue line is total employment in the EU. And, and you see that, of course, there has been an impact, but this has been very mild, certainly very small compared to, to the drop in the, in the performance of the overall economy. And again, this is quite different compared to the global financial crisis where employment performance of the labor market was basically going uh, end in end with the performance of, of, of the economy. Now, why? How is this possible? Well, one of, of the main responses is, of course, the nature of the crisis. Huh? So basically, the, the impact on the economy was driven by the fact that we had to stay home and people were not able to, to, to go to work. But it's also true that there has been an impressive policy response. I put here four charts, which basically give you a sense of the national policy responses, and then of three main instruments which were being put in place at the European level. So if you look at the first chart on the, on, um, up on, on the left, where you see uh, fiscal policy measures put in place at national, sorry, at national level, you see that this has been actually unprecedented. Uh, the first country, which is with Germany, has put in place schemes which actually are equivalent to about 35% of, of GDP. This doesn't mean that uh, this is the amount of money which were made available to, to, to people, but in fact there are schemes which could actually um, be accessed by <coughs> companies essentially, but also all people. This has been much smaller in all the countries, but each and every country of, of the EU has responded in a way which is unprecedented. Certainly very different from the global financial crisis where, in fact, a lot of, 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 of governments didn't have the possibility to, to respond to, to the size of, of the crisis which was uh, taking place. What we have on the, on the right-hand side, what is called SURE, um, I'm, I'm not sure this is a very familiar language, but SURE is a, is a tool which has been put in place at, at European level and is a, a system of loans which the European Commission offered to, to member states at zero interest rate in order to support employment. In many countries, um, what are called short-term work schemes were put in place to basically safeguard employment. 
These were support offered to companies not to fire people, basically to keep people in uh, their job uh, during the, the period of, of the lockdown and, and the crisis. And as you can see, um, Italy and, and Spain are the two countries which have access most of these resources. So these are talking about about 20 billions, or more than 20 billions for, for, for Spain, in order to basically uh, support uh, employment and avoid that people actually could be fired only because of, of temporary reasons. The, um, the third chart, what is called the CRE, <clears throat> is a special instrument which, which is basically is called Coronavirus Response um, Investment Initiative. And this, uh, again, another EU uh, tool which was put in place, and then the purpose was really to give more flexibility to EU budget funds, which countries and regions uh, can, can access, but usually are very rigid and preset ex ante. So more flexibility could be added to, to these um, uh, funds in order to support essentially hospitals. Uh, and in general the, the health sector in order to, to respond to, to the crisis. And also here the, the size is, is quite uh, important. We are still talking about uh, billions. And also in this case, uh, Spain is actually one of, of the most relevant beneficiaries. And then the third one is the, the European Investment Bank which put in place um, funds to support essentially companies. So, the, just to give you an, an idea of uh, how uh, strong has been the, the response um, to fight or to mitigate the impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I think the results are, are there and are important. Uh, we need to make sure that now we do not fall back. And uh, there are a number of risks um, ahead. Um, here I'm talking about uh, macroeconomic uh, risks. I mean, of course, the uncertainty, uncertain evolution of, of the pandemic is, is a major one. So the new variants, uh, um, now the Omicron uh, variants, still represent a main challenge uh, about whether we can go back to a pre-COVID-19 life uh, very soon or we'll have to, to struggle for, for a while, for sure society and the economy are now better prepared than, uh, than one year ago. There are <clears throat> some macroeconomic um, risks related to inflation. It's basically the first time after more than 20 years that we are thinking about uh, inflation and, and rising prices, which actually could have an impact on purchasing power of, uh, of households and, and individuals. And um, inflation, uh, other than having such impact, actually could force um, policies to, to change faster than it was uh, previously planned. Another risk, which I think is, is very sensible here in Spain, is rising energy prices. Uh, this is a, um, has been a major concern in the, in the last months uh, in, uh, in several countries, so not only in, in Spain. And uh, unfortunately, dynamics are linked to very big geo political developments, which are very difficult to, to control and uh, could still represent um, a risk. And then last but not least, and this is actually the point which I would like to develop more in detail, is the uncertainty about the labor market. And because of the heterogeneous impact of, of, of the crisis on, on the labor market, it's actually very difficult to grasp what is going on um, at, at broad level. And uh, we may be in between something which is called slack, so still difficulties in the labor market to go back uh, to previous levels and potentially unemployment and tight labor markets, where actually there are sectors where there is a lot of demand for, for people and for workers, but not sufficient supply. And this is a, a struggle that I think it will, it's not just uh, an issue for the moment, but a challenge in, the, um, uh, in a forward-looking approach with different dynamics across sectors, across occupations, across gender, skills, and age. 
And this, all these elements, I think, make the, complex, the complexity of uh, the situation. Now, as I anticipated earlier, uh, one of the big things about uh, COVID is that it's not only the, the, the short-term impact, but the fact that it is interacting with pre-existing trends. And there are two main pre-existing trends we need to watch and we need to work on, digitalization and the green transition. Now, when it comes to digitalization, COVID, because of its nature, has requested an acceleration of a process which was already ongoing. When you need to accelerate a process, something that in principle could be spread over a long time, there is a number of, of challenges which will arise and we need to be faced. And basically this uh, acceleration has been driven by the need for company, but also for organizations like the public administration to, to generate a pandemic proof production. And the pandemic proof production basically meant more automatization, basically you need less people to go out from their home when to go to work, and digitalization, so the possibility actually to perform your task from your own place. The second element is the green transition. It has been mentioned uh, already <clears throat> by the previous speakers, and this has been accelerated not only because of a, of a change in the perception and in the awareness, but also because there is, at political level, more and more interest in investing in, in the green economy. Both these trends will result in job creation and job destruction. At different sectors, different occupations. And this is basically what we need to, to, to consider if we want to have an economy which actually is meeting the needs of society and generates a society where basically not a large part of the population is left out. <clears throat> Let me show you some, some, some data about what we are observing in terms of technological change and education of workers and in terms of occupation. Now, if you look at the, the chart on, on the left hand, hand side, basically you see a very clear bifurcation. And this is a bifurcation uh, between the share of employment of those which have higher education, so let's say a, a, a university degree, and those who have low education. You see that there is a clear trend whereby more and more of those who are in the labor market and are employed, actually they have a tertiary education. Um, the trend is, is actually um, quite stable, but it has been declining basically since COVID for those who are um, old and mid-level um, education. This is basically consistent with what uh, in uh, the economic literature is called skill bias technological change. Um, this is somewhat something which is uh, expected whereby technology tend to favor or to be advantageous for those who are more educated. The second um, chart um, is related to occupation. And also, in this case, trends are, are less clear cut, but what you can see is that uh, occupations uh, uh, which are led by professionals have become increasingly important in, in the economy and in the labor market. While those, for instance, of what are called skilled workers have been declining. And this is essentially due to automation and the fact that certain tasks basically can be replaced by machines, whether these are robots or computers. And also, this is something which is actually quite known in the economic literature, which is so-called task bias, technological change, and job polarization. So basically, all the, the tasks which are root, can be routinized are uh, deemed to, to decline because they can be replaced by, um, somehow by machines. While works which are uh, more creative and uh, which require intellectual uh, work are likely to, to, to become uh, more and more in, important. 
Now, just very briefly, uh, because I think that the gender dimension is, uh, is, is an important one, you can see that, uh, that there is not much difference. Um, if you look at uh, um, left hand side, where up you have uh, male and uh, below you have female employment by educational level, uh, but possibly with one uh, important point is that uh, in fact, uh, women which are in the labor market and with, who are employed tend to have a higher education degree than men. And, and this is uh, somewhat related to the fact that in, in some countries, women we, who have a um, low degree of education tend to be home and to remain out of the labor market. This is actually an, an important point because uh, uh, with an aging society, and I will be speaking about this uh, later on, um, women can become an important source of new supply of, of, of labor in a forward-looking perspective. Same kind of trends um, are there for, for, for occupations. Now, <clears throat> another um, um, point which was already mentioned earlier, and um, it's related actually to a technological change, and which has been um, forced by, by, by COVID, is the search of teleworking. And uh, I prepared this, this chart to give you a sense of the differences uh, which exist across countries. Basically, the, the blue bar are the, the, the share of workers who were used to work at home uh, already before the pandemic. Uh, the orange line are those who started to work at home as a result of, of the pandemic. And, as you can see, there is a huge diversity uh, across um, European countries. Now, how can we explain this difference? It's not only about tools. It's not only about access to, uh, to, 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 to digital tools or the skills of people. A lot of these differences really depends on the structure of the economy. For economies which are more service-based, um, uh, the possibility to uh, work remotely is certainly uh, 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 less a reality than for other countries. And this explains why countries uh, uh, like, like Spain, uh, but also like uh, um, Greece, still tend to have uh, um, a limited share of uh, 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 teleworking among the, the, the workers. While some of the Nordic countries, and the Finland is, is really quite an exception, where the use of, of digital tools is actually very widespread, um, the, uh, the pandemic brought a big change, but uh, this was just possible because of, of the nature of, uh, of the economy. And this is uh, somewhat related uh, to the importance of um, sectors in, uh, in the economy, as I said. And on, on this chart, actually prepared um, the distribution of employment um, by economic activities, where the two economic activities, these are what are called lockdown sectors, uh, basically those which are uh, service related, whether this is uh, uh, trade, or whether this is uh, accommodation, or whether this is art and uh, entertainment. Um, basically, even uh, in mid-2021, when the situation uh, basically uh, quite normalized, uh, the lockdown sectors were unable to go back to the previous level. Uh, and this is true both for, for male and, 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 and female while other sectors uh, have uh, seen an increase in employment uh, above the levels of, of the uh, pre-pandemic. And, and this is actually, um, if you want, a, a small sign, a mild sign um, of uh, relocation of workers across sectors, which has been forced by uh, the pandemic. I think it's quite interesting to, to note that uh, at European level, uh, in 2021, and, and um, basically by June, in the second quarter, there was a, an increase in total female employment. Uh, while basically for male, we are, um, the situation was uh, still below what we had uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, in fact, the impact of, of the COVID on, on, on female is, is, is actually a very complex uh, phenomenon to, uh, to understand. 
And then final, final thing, uh, which I think is, is still relevant, um, a picture of what is happening to unemployment. Until now, I've been speaking mostly about employment. This is really about unemployment and uh, what are called atypical contracts. And I put here a comparison across countries. So in the selected uh, economies that I'm presenting, basically the largest EU economies, um, Spain is still the country with, which has uh, the highest level of uh, unemployment. Of course, there was a surge uh, during the pandemic, but now there is a clear trend, a clear declining trend with, uh, um, uh, with a fall. And what I think it's interesting to note is that unlikely the financial crisis, this time, this has not been accompanied by a surge in atypical contracts. Here by atypical contracts, um, I mean essentially part-time and temporary contracts, which um, is, has actually been the case also in, in, in other countries, with the exception of Germany. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting to know that Germany is usually the country with the lowest unemployment rates in, Euro in Europe, but it's also the countries with the highest uh, share of atypical contracts. Some of you may have heard about the mini jobs, which basically were created after two, 2000, where a lot of people have uh, um, part-time um, uh, contracts. Last point I want to make on uh, the diagnosis is about inequality, income inequality. I know that for this audience and for this place, inequality is actually a crucial indicator. Um, and I think it's something that needs to be monitored. Um, I have been looking at, at data, and uh, in fact, it's still really very early to understand what has been the impact of, of the pandemic of, uh, on um, inequality. What we know is that, uh, for instance, in, uh, in Spain as a whole, um, inequality was on a declining trend while actually it was in a very strong increasing trend in Germany. So I really want to take the opportunity to also break some myths about what is going on um, uh, across countries. But it's, it's clear that uh, we need to, to understand what the pandemic has, has done to, to income in, in inequality. And I think that the, the pandemic is also um, posing questions about how to measure inequality, and whether income is the, the main indicator, or at least the only indicator, if we want to think of inequality. And uh, I think the pandemic is, is opening up um, a bit our eyes, and uh, um, access to health service, access to digital services, access to education, and the quality of the environment in which people live will increasingly be um, um, additional indicators to monitor if we want to have a serious picture about the situation um, of inequality uh, in a region, uh, in a country. Let me now move to the policy challenges. Now, against this background with all these changes and uh, um, the interaction uh, between um, previous trends and new challenges. What are the questions on which policymakers should be focusing on? And here I highlighted a tree, which I think actually quite aligns with what uh, was said earlier. The first one is labor market transition. And labor market transition means how can we make sure that young people can enter the labor market and find a job? How can we make sure that people who have the job can actually keep it? The second point is a question mark about the European social model. It's really about the welfare state. Is still relevant, the old welfare state, and is it sustainable given the challenges? And the third one is about greening the economy. And I think here we really need to be very aware of the trade-off between the challenges of the short term and maybe the cost of the short term and the long-term sustainability and opportunities that such a transition could offer. Let me explain a bit more in detail these three points. So, labor market transitions. Now, as I said, the impact of COVID was very unequal. 
And basically, depending on the skills you are, the sector where you work, or the, the, the task that you perform, uh, you may have the possibility to keep your job or basically to lose it. This implies that, that we will face a real location of, of resources, of, of people, of factors of production, and essentially of people, uh, driven by uh, the digital transition and the green transition. And there are some groups which may be particularly at risk, youth and those who have low skills. And some sectors, of course, because, uh, as I said, autom automation and digitalization uh, could actually replace people. In this context, education and adult learning, so basically giving the possibility to people to reskill themselves or just to upskill themselves, will be of crucial importance. I'm um, sharing with you this, this chart, which um, uh, was prepared recently by CEDIFOP. CEDIFOP is an EU agency uh, which is focusing on skills, and they have uh, something which is called the, the skill uh, panorama. And they monitor um, uh, vacancies, on, online vacancies. So everything, they, they do a huge um, web scraping and monitor actually how companies are changing their vacancies, so the description of, of the uh, future job post. And they have identified some skills which are in, in decline and those which are in, in growth. And uh, I think the, the clear message about uh, this chart is that there is a fast change in skills demand. And basically, some of those skills are actually so-called soft skills. It's about capacity to adapt. It's, it's really about team working. Um, it's about um, 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 uh, sorry, assumed responsibilities. So a lot of soft skills, and then some key um, knowledge skills, which are mostly uh, based on uh, data analysis, engineering, um, software creation. So these changes are happening actually uh, very fast. So if this is what we are seeing on the, on the side of skills demand, the question is how can we endow people with the right skills to meet um, um, such change? And as, as I said, I think education and adult learning will uh, be playing a, a, a crucial role. And I think universities will be faced with, with major challenges uh, in order to, to prepare the young people to, uh, to enter the, the labor market. And this is basically due uh, uh, to, to the rapid change and uh, the uncertainty about how this rapid change will materialize in terms of, of new jobs. So uh, some universities are actually engaging in what is called educational foresight. So you need to, to make foresight exercise, looking at 20 years, 30 years ahead, in order to, to understand how the needs will be um, evolving, and trying to, to highlight what are the new jobs, which 10 years ago didn't exist, maybe today do not exist, but could become actually in, in demand in the, in the near future. Um, data scientist uh, now is, is very much fashionable. It's something that basically didn't exist as a profession, I think not even five years ago. Or genetic engineer or blockchain engineer, just to give you example. Or YouTuber. Sorry, this is not only about very highly educated people, but uh, also uh, just reflecting uh, the, the, the change in, in society. But also to prepare uh, people for a new workplace. Um, COVID has uh, moved us in, in a different world where not everyone is going to the office every day, where not everyone is meeting the, the team every day. Um, so most likely hybrid solutions which combine uh, teleworking and uh, um, in-presence work will remain there and where the labor market will be more flexible and contracts will be more flexible, maybe much more based on, on projects rather than on, on standard contracts. 
And then the two uh, last things, which are uh, really about how to prepare the people, is how to help young people to develop non-cognitive skills. So it's not about knowledge of, of science, it's really how to interact, uh, but also emotional intelligence. Uh, so things which uh, in, in, in the past were certainly not when certainly not at the center of um, educational systems. And then, last but not uh, least, the importance of multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, and even transdisciplinarity in order to analyze complex systems. The complexity of the economy and of society has increased uh, strongly. The second part is really about adult learning. So basically, I believe that uh, all adults, regardless of their level of education, will be faced with the need of retraining. I hold a PhD, and uh, with my organization, we have trainings basically for all of us. I'm doing trainings at least two or three years, sorry, two or three times a year, from issues related to, to management, to communication, basically, to improve soft skills. Um, and I think this will become a reality for, for everyone. But not everyone will have the same facility, the same easiness to access uh, trainings. And I think the, 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 those who will face the most difficulties are those who have low skills. Uh, and this, I think, it's, um, it's an issue on which regional and local authorities can make the difference in partnership with uh, the, the local stakeholders. Uh, because uh, uh, this is uh, an issue where uh, broad policies can, sorry, can give uh, the, the broad direction. But in reality, what will make the difference is how it will be implemented and how the different actors at local level will be um, involved. And then a final point, which uh, I think it's, um, it's very important, is that uh, the older workers, and the older workers are not old people, uh, because uh, life expectancy is, uh, uh, is actually very long, may be forced or may just choose to exit the labor market. And this, I think, is something that should be avoided. Um, in the United States, this phenomenon is just huge. There has been a, a, a huge fall in labor market participation, mostly driven by older workers, which are afraid uh, by the changes in the digitalization and feel they're not up to standard to continue to work, or those who fear uh, automation, or basically because of automation are forced to exit the labor market, and for them it becomes very difficult to find an another job. And I think this is, a, uh, this is a challenge, especially in an aging society. And this was, was mentioned earlier, um, and also with impacts on uh, our welfare state and our welfare model. So just to give you an, an, uh, an idea of how aging is, is concrete, um, on, the, on the right hand side you, you can see this, this chart which basically um, represents a population by age groups and gender in 2019 and the projections for 2070. And basically what, what you see is that uh, um, the blue and the red lines which are more evident are becoming uh, much longer when you go up. And this basically uh, means that because of aging population, um, there, there will be a large effect on the structure of the population, so less young people and a strong impact on working age population and um, an expansion of, of the older population, which is uh, driven also because of increase in, in, in life expectancy. But overall, actually for Europe, we expect a decline in population in general, uh, even accounting for uh, projections on, 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 on migration, and especially in, in working age population, which basically for, from a welfare state perspective, it means that uh, those who work and to con those who contribute to the welfare state um, will decline, so will be less and less compared to those who will need um, support. <clears throat> 
in addition to this, there are all the changing in, in society which can represent uh, um, a challenge for, uh, for the welfare state. And this is the rise of atypical contracts. Uh, atypical contracts in uh, most cases do not contribute to the welfare state as much as standard contracts. And the other thing is that uh, this, the digitalization um, and the, uh, for instance, increased women participation in the labor market are generating new risks for individuals which needs to be taken into account by the welfare states in order for the welfare states actually to remain relevant. That's why at the beginning I said the welfare states should be sustainable and should remain relevant to, to citizens. And <clears throat> that's not uh, uh, the, the, the place for discussing this, but uh, I'm happy to, to take questions on this. What we are seeing in, in Europe is a so-called recalibration of the welfare state and a broad movement uh, somewhat away from social protections and moving towards social investment. So investing in, in society, <clears throat> investing in people in order for people to, to become more resilient um, against uh, shock. And this is somewhat also a constraint because uh, resources available uh, to, uh, for, the, for the welfare states in general public finances are facing uh, major uh, constraints. Let me now move to greening the, the, the economy. <clears throat> Quite a lot has, has, has been uh, said. Um, I want to, to highlight actually a few things. What does it mean, greening the economy? Uh, this is something which is uh, 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 talking about uh, quite a lot, but somewhat to, to, to people it remains something which is uh, quite abstract. In fact, it's very real. And uh, uh, in a sense, uh, the, the two, I think, maybe the, the three most concrete things uh, that actually uh, could lead to, to, to a greening of, of the economy is in fact energy efficiency in constructions, this is often not really considered um, as a, a real greening the economy, but in fact, a lot of consumption of fossil fuels comes from um, heating and cooling houses or offices and buildings in general. So um, especially in certain countries, this is uh, actually a major issue. The second is transportation, it's mobility. This was mentioned earlier. Mobility in cities. Uh, can make a huge difference when it comes uh, um, to uh, CO2 emission reductions. And the third is new technologies. Whether this is electric vehicles or whether this is uh, um, carbon capture technologies, these are basically the three elements which can make the difference. And all of them require investment. That's why the, the green transition is actually associated so much um, to investment, especially at, at the European uh, level, and I will come to this um, um, in a moment. Now, uh, one of the main issues when with, the, with greening the, the, the economy, and this was also mentioned earlier, is the intergenerational um, issue. Uh, climate change is essentially and fundamentally uh, an issue of intergenerational fairness. Basically, to guarantee the future generation that will have uh, um, access to um, a clean nature, uh, that uh, they will not be hit by extreme climate events uh, systematically. I think uh, that what happened in the last days in, in Spain, or you may have heard of the tornadoes in the United States, made us really think of what is going on with, with the nature and, and with climate. Uh, but on the other side, uh, taking care of, of such issues is likely to require a cost today. A cost which I think needs to be seen as, as an investment, but which um, uh, needs to, to be faced and on which I think we need to be uh, uh, very clear and, 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 and transparent. I will uh, speed up because otherwise uh, uh, I will make my speech too long. And now let me move uh, to the third point, um, the EU levers. How can the European Union actually support European citizens and European local institutions in order to face those challenges? 
And so, um, I want to, to highlight actually three points. One is uh, the extent to which uh, um, the EU approach to fight COVID actually has changed compared to the global financial crisis. The second point is next generation EU, what it is, uh, how it is working. And the third point, I repeat again, I think the national and local institutions actually can play a key role to, to make uh, this change um, a success. Now, I, I mean, in the room there are quite some, some young people, so they may not recall so well the global financial crisis, which now is, is, is a decade uh, away from us. But I'm pretty confident that most of us have still a vivid memory of how difficult the, uh, the financial crisis uh, that hit basically starting in around 2010 and then afterwards has, um, has been difficult for, for the economy and, and society. But also from a European perspective, it was uh, the, the, the trigger actually of, of clashes and uh, main differences of, of view on what was needed to, to be done and who was responsible actually for what was happening. This time has been completely different. The, the, the EU um, the debate, the EU discourse has been has moved towards a much more, I would say, solidaristic approach where basically all the EU countries found themselves on the same boat and in need to, to find a, um, a common response um, uh, to, to face the crisis. And I think this has uh, even more value uh, in a context of uh, huge global uncertainty and uh, uh, think of um, uh, Russia, uh, think of, 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 the, the, um, of the clash between the United States and, um, and, and China. In a, global, in a globalized world and in a globalized economy, uh, being part of, uh, of a block which is basically um, assessing the, the challenges, um, if you want, in, in, in a way which is, uh, um, on which there is agreement, is, is actually um, very important that can make uh, the difference. And uh, the, the, the second difference, other than the change in the discourse, is the fact that uh, new substantial tools have been created to, to, uh, to fight the crisis. And in, in particular, new financial instruments. Uh, this is really the, the uh, recovery and resilient fund. Uh, we'll speak about it in a moment. The size, this is uh, the first time that actually so, much, so many resources and so much funds have, have been put on the table. And the third one, which from a governance perspective actually is, is a major change, is the fact that uh, these new financial instruments have been financed by issuing EU common debt, which was just a taboo, uh, basically, before COVID. Now, let me uh, describe you quickly what is this uh, recovery and resilient funds. <clears throat> resilient fund under the, the next generation. So it's, it's basically the main arm of uh, the, the next generation EU. This is quite big. It's more than uh, 700 billion euros, so a uh, huge amount of money. And basically about half of it is grant. So this money will be offered to, to the member states without need to pay back. And this is, uh, again, this is a major change complain, uh, compared to the past. And another half, about half, is, is loans at almost uh, zero interest rate. Uh, now, the, 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 um, the member states had basically to prepare a strategy, a plan, to decide how they would use these this, this resources. And 22 countries have done so. Spain was actually one of the first ones to, to submit a, a plan to the, to the European Union. And the disbursement have started. So, um, substantial amount of resources will, will come, and of course this is, comes in addition to the EU budget funds. <clears throat> now, um, under the RRF, basically the Commission gives uh, uh, two uh, conditions, so that basically about one third of the money spent need to go for the green transition. So that's, it needs to be climate investment. And about 20% of the funds need to be uh, expenditure to foster digital transition. Then there are other objectives, but in, in practice, there is a lot of uh, freedom 
for, for the member states to decide how to spend this money if they stay into these broad um, indications. <clears throat> and uh, here on the, on the right hand side, um, there is a, a bit of, a, of an idea who actually will be using the, um, receiving the money, sorry. And um, Italy, Italy, my home country, and, and, and Spain actually are the two countries uh, which will receive the largest part of the grants. It's about 70 billion. So this is a quite substantial amount, and uh, uh, Italy has also requested already uh, more than 100 billion of uh, um, loans. So Italy is a country which has very large sovereign debt. Um, so having access to resources at zero interest rate actually makes a difference. Um, Spain has not yet made requests from loans of very low, but this actually can, can come um, in the future. And um, uh, then basically how this, this, this money will be um, invested. So here there are a lot of these uh, flow charts, but basically <clears throat> I will just explain the, the first one. So the, the, the green bar on the left hand side uh, measures the, the green transition. So at the European level in uh, um, overall, there will be about 200 billion in uh, green investment, which will be used by, by the member states. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, most of it is actually going to, to go to the construction sector, which is basically the blue line uh, in, the, in, in the first chart. Then it will be for electricity. We know that uh, energy transition is basically moving towards electricity and then transportation. Mobility in cities is actually one of, on, of the main um, way to, uh, to make the green transition possible. The second floor uh, illustrates the, 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 the digital transition uh, where basically a lot is going to educational uh, sector. Uh, then uh, smart and sustainable growth, uh, then social and territorial cohesion, then health, and then policies for, for next generations. So <clears throat> these are basically the main sectors which are likely to, to benefit from, uh, from, from these funds in order to, to achieve uh, the different um, ob objectives. And once again, uh, um, a lot of uh, what you are seeing in this picture, I think, is, is in line with some of uh, the elements which were mentioned uh, by previous uh, speakers in terms of, of priority for achieving the, uh, the green transition. Um, just a, a, a last point on, uh, on, um, on how actually this money will, will be used <clears throat> and how, um, what they represent in, in relative terms compared to, to public investment. So the, the size is, is relevant, is, is, is important. Uh, this is um, especially the case uh, um, uh, for countries, small countries like uh, Greece and, and Croatia, but also in, in the case of, of, of Spain, uh, we are speaking about uh, an important um, share of, of, of GDP. And also I think what is, what is quite interesting is that uh, a number of, um, of these, um, uh, part of these funds uh, will finance new projects, uh, but also in, in some cases, they will uh, support the finalization of projects which were already ongoing and which are still suitable um, for the general objectives. Um, last point, which I, I think still deserves to, to, to be said, is that uh, basically these um, uh, recovery and resilient funds come on, on top of cohesion funds, so EU uh, budget funds, and uh, what this um, uh, scatter plot uh, represents is uh, um, the share of uh, annual cohesion policy grants and the annual RRF grants. These are average over, over six years. And I think it's, it's quite interesting to, to note that uh, uh, there is a bit of, uh, of, of division between East and, and South. So <laughs> all the countries in, uh, with, the, with the orange um, dot uh, which are essentially Eastern European countries are above uh, the line. Uh, this means that they, they will continue to receive a much larger share of EU cohesion funds compared to, to the RRF funds. 
um, while the opposite is, is true for uh, especially the Mediterranean economies. Uh, like uh, Spain and, and Italy, for which the RRF is, is actually a major uh, uh, change compared to, uh, to the past. And then my, my last point, and this um, uh, I anticipated, I think that uh, in uh, the implementation of, of the projects that can be uh, actually realized uh, with such resources, but not only with su such resources, I think in general, I think the institutions play a key role. And what I mean by institutions is, is basically uh, authorities uh, and at national level, regional level, but also at, at local level. And their administrative capacity and their capacity to, to implement policies that respond to the needs of society will make a major change between uh, societies where a lot of people will be behind and those who will be able to, to, to face the new challenges in a successful way. And this is, I'm not telling you this because of the setting. I think in Europe, uh, the major difference between successful, let me call it region, but like subnational entities, and, and those who will be in difficulties will be really determined by the quality and the capacity of institutions. And I think what it is, is important, also giving societal changes, mostly driven by the social media, so, social network, a more participatory approach, whereby the voices of, of, of people are actually heard, uh, can make a, a big difference in terms of understanding the needs but also, on the other side, because I think it's, the change is reciprocal, in trying to make people aware of major challenges which are ahead in the long term. So let me just conclude this uh, very long talk. I think that, uh, that, that COVID has represented a, a really sui generis, very special uh, crisis. Uh, for which the, the, the policy response has been unprecedented. And I think until now, it managed to avoid the wars, even though not, not everything was perfect. That's not the point. But I think without the policy response that we have seen, uh, we could have been in a much worse situation. Uh, there has been intervention at, at national level uh, to mitigate the impact, and now also at EU level. And I think the main difference is that while at national level the purpose was really to mitigate the short-term impact and some of the national policy will have now to be withdrawn, I think the EU level, at EU level there are levers which can actually help us to uh, move to a longer-term approach through investment and, and, and changes, mostly to address the twin transition, so the, the green and the digital um, uh, transition. When it comes to the, the, to the challenges, I think that the pandemic has really worked as an accelerator. I mean, so, some of, of, of the trends, some of the challenges were already known. Uh, the, the green and the digital transition are not new, are not, uh, they did not emerge because of COVID. But the COVID is working as an accelerator. So we have actually shorter time in order to, to, to prepare society and to make people uh, able uh, to be part of, of the change and not a victim of, of, of the change. And this, I think, it's, it's crucial. And I think, for me, that the two main messages is really think of education and adult learning, like skill building. I think that's, that's really very uh, crucial to make uh, labor, more, labor market dynamics positive so that they can support also the economic performance, but also that from a societal point of view, um, uh, people are part of, of the change. And then, once again, the role of uh, institution uh, to make uh, the change um, effective. And with this, I will close. Many thanks for, for your attention. Thank you so much, Kimfia. And now we are going to make some questions. Please, if you can be short with answers so we can do more yes. questions. OK? Let's start with the first question. 
Let's see. Programs such as Building the Future, led by the government of Gipuzkoa, aim to transform the way of doing politics. What is the social impact of this type of political instrument? I think it's, I think it's very important to, in, in a society which is changing so fast and, and so much, uh, I think remaining with the, an old-fashioned way of, of doing policies is going to, to deliver responses which would just be delayed. So in a sense, trying to understand people and uh, trying to put in place a new way of, of doing policies is actually the best way not to remain behind the curve and being able to, to drive the, the change. Perfect. We have time to, for another one, okay? Do you think that institutional efforts to improve social inequality are sufficient? I think inequality is uh, one of the main challenges of, of this society because uh, the sense of unfairness is one of the worst sentiment that people can have. Being a part of an unfair society where you, you lag behind makes you unhappy, creates discontent, which then generates vicious circle for, for society and, and for politics. But one warning uh, I mentioned earlier, inequality is not just inequality of income. Inequality of opportunities, inequality in access to health, inequality in access to, to digitalization. These are new forms of inequality which needs to be monitored and, and checked. Another one. I can? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Since higher education candidates and professionals will likely be benefiting, sorry, <laughs> in terms of employment and higher education, is more common among upper middle classes, will this trend favor inequality? This is actually a very important issue. So social mobility, it's, it's crucial in a, in a society with positive developments. And uh, if we create a society whereby uh, people or young people who are part of a, f of, of a family where the level of education is low and they do not have the possibility to grow, actually will set back, I think, the, the entire society. Now, this is a, this is a big challenge in, uh, in, um, in an environment whereby, basically, the, these so-called mid-level skills, which are very close to the, 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 uh, the middle class, are in, on a declining trend. So this, this is actually posing a, um, a, a challenges. So we really need to, to make sure that especially young people have the opportunities to or go for higher education or just to have the right skills. Maybe one, one important message uh, which I would like to deliver is that in order to find a good job, a job which brings satisfaction, a job which enables you to have a good standard of life, you do not necessarily need to have uh, a tertiary de degree education. I think this is very different from 10 years ago, but you need to have the right skills. So, of course, tertiary education is important, but I think it's not the only answer. Skills are becoming at least as important as education. Could global digitalization widen the inequality gap? This is uh, um, a major question. Yeah. Um, there, are some, there, are some, there is some evidence that basically globalization and global competition reinforce some of the trend whereby uh, automation and downward pressure on wages uh, has resulted in uh, um, some factories closing in, in some areas, especially in, in Europe, because production was delocalized um, um, abroad. So this is uh, something that actually um, I think has already happened, but it's not necessarily the main challenge of, of the future. The main challenge of the future and actually how to, to, to fill this gap is really thinking forward and to boost our capability to be part of a global economy in a different way than in the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, LTV, for answering the questions and, and for, for your work. Thank you so much. Many thanks to all for your attention and for giving me the opportunity. Thanks.
Thank you.